welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. COVID-19 was first identified late last year with a cluster of pneumonia cases caused by a new coronavirus. We now understand quite a bit more about COVID-19 and its uh, major impacts on the respiratory tract and the lungs. Here to discuss respiratory management and critical care, as well as recovery from COVID-19, is Dr. Dan Diedrich, who's an anesthesiologist and critical care specialist at the Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Diedrich. Good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me. You know, it's especially fun for me to have you here, Dan, because you helped train me when I was a resident, and now they're letting me interview you, so that's kind of fun. Be kind, <laughs> please, be kind. <laughs> Thank you for being here. So, um, Dan, help us to understand what happens when someone comes into the hospital, and we hear so much about people being hospitalized, but they can't have their family members in. What happens to them after they disappear into the hospital? What kind of care do people get for COVID-19, and who might provide that to them? These patients will present with a primary respiratory problem. So, you know, they may be at home for a while and feel at some point I need to go in. So the emergency department will likely be the first point of contact. You know, since we don't have a, a rapid test for this disease, like IE a result back in minutes uh, for the virus responsible for COVID-19, you know, the ED really has a tall task of sorting out who has this disease or who has an, another disease process. So it, it's a very mixed picture up front until we get more information and the disease takes, uh, does the thing it does that we can recognize it. So at that point, if a patient needs ICU care, uh, they'll be transferred to the ICU that best matches their needs, kind of what would be our standard procedures. Now, at some point, if it is determined that a patient does have uh, COVID-19, or at some point during their hospitalization does uh, develop uh, COVID-19, then we would transfer them to a single ICU uh, where the, the training and clinical care has been aligned uh, specifically to the treatment of this disease process. When we're listening in the news, we hear so much about the various roles of people who take care of uh, patients with COVID-19. And it seems that the physicians and the nurses both receive a lot of praise, but I know that in the hospital, there are so many other groups working with our patients. Tell me a little bit about that and what is a respiratory therapist? As you pointed out, there's many frontline clinicians involved in the care, but I, I think respiratory therapy, uh, the therapists that, that do that are, are some of the unsung heroes, unrecognized heroes. And as I mentioned before, the COVID-19 disease process heavily impacts the respiratory system. And the respiratory therapists, that's their specific uh, training that, that they go through for schooling. So, you know, their expertise uh, really starts back in the emergency department. They determine uh, the need and level of oxygen support. Uh, if the patient does deteriorate and they require breathing tube placement, you know, they're the ones that are helping uh, the proceduralists do that you know, they are the ones who really manage the mechanical ventilator to the goal set out by the providers. And, and they really make sure that, uh, that the patient is getting the right level of oxygen and, and we're doing uh, therapies that are, are protected to the lungs. But usually the respiratory therapists are the first ones who make the, who, who get a sense of, well, this patient has recovered and doesn't need the mechanical ventilator. And, and when the patient's uh, are along their recovery pathway, uh, the respiratory therapists are the, the actual ones that are doing a lot of the rehabilitation. So really the respiratory therapist provides a role from really at the time of presentation all the way uh, through their discharge. I know when I was an anesthesia resident that some of the respiratory therapists who worked in the intensive care units uh, at Mayo were really amazing and, and very helpful in teaching me uh, how to manage patients. So it's great, thank you for sharing that. We talked about the changes in the respiratory system. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happens in the lungs and respiratory system of a patient with COVID-19 that makes them need to be on a ventilator? Sure, you know, the, the understanding of this process of how this disease is affecting the, the lungs and uh, the body is, you know, is evolving. And, and every week, I, it seems that what was stated as a, you know, a goal the previous week is now 
totally the opposite. So our, our, as we gain more knowledge of this disease, we're gonna, we'll continue to fine tune our understanding of it. But you know, I, I try to simplify things myself, and I, I, to me, there's really kind of two parts to this. There is an acute, uh, an acute infection stage, and this is really where the, the virus is causing the damage as well as the, as the damage that, that the body is doing, kind of fighting this disease, you know, there's collateral damages. The, the lung is, is certainly that, uh, that type of an organ. You know, later on, as we get past that acute phase, you know, the body gets control of the virus, but there can be fibrosis or scarring of the lungs, which, which you know, can cripple the lungs long-term. And that's, you know, that's really kind of a scary thing. Additionally, just, the mechanical ventilator itself can cause injury by how it provides air. And, you know, we at Mayo are actually very good at preventing this type. And, and again, as mentioned before, this is where our respiratory therapists have, have become very good at mitigating this problem. And they're, um, and, you know, making sure that the type of mechanical ventilation, it's just what we need, no more and that we're providing very safe levels of ventilation. I bet that many of our uh, listeners and viewers have never heard so much about mechanical ventilators as they have in the news lately with the um, concern for shortage that we wouldn't have enough um, to, to provide for patients who needed them. Can you tell us a little bit about how does a mechanical ventilator work? How does a patient get hooked up to one? And what, is the, what are the most common uses for them typically when we're not having a COVID? 19 pandemic. So there, there are many types of mechanical ventilators out there. And in some ways, it's kind of like cars. There's just many different types. And, you know, largely, these differences are in the, the software that the machines have. So there's different modes, which again, represent kind of different ways of, uh, uh, or represent different types of software in there. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, without getting into a lot of the details, the mechanical ventilators really move air in and out of the lungs. And, you know, they can do this different ways with pressures and volumes of air. But it, it, again, it's just air moving in and out of the lungs. And really, the lungs function from a respiratory standpoint. It, that's where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. So that's, that's what the lungs do. And, and again, you can think when you move air into the lungs, that's you're introducing oxygen. And when air is removed from the lungs, this removes the carbon dioxide. What these machines do, again, there's problems with the lungs, that's what the disease causes, and these, these, these machines support the lungs through these processes and really buy them time uh, for the body to heal. Do we have enough mechanical ventilators at Mayo to take care of the patients that we have or that we might see, and do you worry that we're going to run short? This is a question we're asked daily almost and uh, by our staff as well as uh, state officials and, and federal officials. And, you know, with the current models that we're looking at now at the time of this podcast, the answer is yes, a very easy yes. You know, early on, it was predicted that we would have a lot more patients that needed mechanical ventilation. And we were very actively preparing for this type of scenario. I, I, I don't think, I mean, I, we worked, many of us, three to four weeks straight preparing for this. And a lot of that uh, effort was spent planning on using mechanical ventilators that are not normally used in an ICU, such as transport ventilators and machines that you're well acquainted with, anesthesia machines. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make this happen. You, you, anesthesia machines in particular need different connections than a normal ICU ventilator to work in an ICU environment. But you know, our, again, our respiratory therapists and others, you know, figured out a way to do this. It, it goes even beyond that capability, you know, having to monitor our, do we, are we going to have enough oxygen uh, to, to run the ventilators? It, it goes into even that. And our respiratory therapists were uh, well on top of that. And, and we at one point figured out that, you know, in, in order to, to fill an ICU with all mechanical ventilators, we had to make sure that there was enough oxygen that could get from the storage tank out back up to the vent, up to the ICU. So, you know, again, it, this is all the activity that was spent uh, making sure we could deliver the care uh, that, uh, that we needed to, and, and we felt very confident that we could do that. It's a lot to think about when you're planning for this. It's just amazing. Um, whether or not someone needs assistance with their breathing, what other kinds of care might they require in either the hospital or in the intensive care unit if they're hospitalized with COVID-19? 
So while this disease is uh, primarily directed at the lungs, there, there are many other organ systems affected simply when you get critically ill. All right. This goes outside of even the COVID disease. And, and really the ICU team, the, the, the clinicians uh, there, again, nurses, respiratory therapists, they're trained to anticipate and offer support to all these other bodily systems. So, you know, we, we have patients sedated, for, uh, you know, to, to maintain level of comfort. Uh, uh, COVID uh, also affects the heart. So monitoring the heart to making sure it continues to function properly. Blood vessels can dilate, so you may have to add um, blood pressure medicines. The kidneys may, may uh, have some dysfunction. So again, making sure that if dialysis, and you know, all, all of these things is what the ICU team really tries to anticipate and head off if you can, and if not, really support the patient through this, uh, giving the chance for the body to uh, direct its attention to healing. Dan, I'm throwing in an extra question here on you, but it's just something um, that people might be curious about. We've heard so much about, there have been over 100,000 deaths from COVID-19. When someone does die of the disease, what is it that they die of? Is it a respiratory failure? That's a tricky question because, you know, every patient is different. So and depending on what levels of organ system dysfunction they have, um, that would be what they succumb from. So again, in this disease, primarily it would be a respiratory respiratory problems. The, the function of the lung deteriorates so much that it just can't uh, exchange that carbon dioxide for oxygen that it needs and uh, that has very uh, deleterious effects on the body and whole. So that's primarily the main problem. But you know, you know, if a patient is on the breathing machine for a number of day or a number of weeks, uh, certainly secondary infections could take place that it could affect organs. So, so it it really is patient specific to the problems uh, that that their body may be facing. Sure, that makes sense. You know, all of us are so appreciative of the work that you. Um, and colleagues like you, nurses, respiratory therapists, et cetera, are doing right on the front lines in the um, intensive care units and within the hospital to care for patients. What, do we, what are we doing at Mayo Clinic to protect um, our employees and our workers from um, being exposed to COVID-19 or um, uh, having the potential to um, become infected with it? You know, there's just a lot of activity going on, certainly that's been in the news about uh, PPE and what types of protection the individual can wear. And I, that ends up being a lot more of a supply issue, but I think, you know, a large uh, part of um, what I'm doing actually right now is trying to figure out, uh, along with our infectious disease colleges, you know, what types of procedures do we need to wear that type of protection, making sure we have protection available and then trying to figure out when we should be using it. Again, making our what would norm, in normal operations would be considered a very safe procedure and just making sure that, that we are doing, uh, putting in place the right protections. So examples, uh, putting viral filters on ventilators to keep the air free of expelled virus. So any, as I mentioned before, when you move air in, the patient then move it out, it gets expelled, so making sure filters are in there. Again, our, our respiratory therapists have come up with some ingenious devices, and that's what I'm most familiar with being their medical directors, you know, developing kind of a MacGyver approach uh, or solution to suction patients with tracheostomies, which moves, you know, that simple procedure in normal times from a high risk down to a low risk procedure. Any patient that requires a surgery, say you have even a knee replacement or a toe surgery, you'll get an incentive spirometer to keep your lungs open. You know, that's deep breathing and potential coughing, which could put providers at risk. So, you know, we found a way to put viral filters on there so that moving forward, as we're gonna probably see a certain amount of this in the hospital at any given time, our therapist developed a way to transport patients on non-invasive ventilation to the hospital, which again is a high-risk procedure, not something you want to be moving a patient around the hospital, but figuring out a way to, to take a neonatal oxygen tent and developing a way that we can still uh, put that over the patient 
and, and deliver the therapy they need and having a suction to kind of evacuate any potential leak that might there that protect the therapist. So this, this is what we're spending a lot of time on now as we shift from treating uh, a lot of COVID patients to how can we operate safely in, a, in an environment where we're going to have a lot of, uh, we're going to have a, a low level of, or a certain level of, of COVID patients in the system. That's amazing. That's a neat story. What is it they say that necessity is the mother of invention? It's been amazing to see all of the new developments and the things that people creatively come up with when they don't have other um, means or supplies or a way to do it. So interesting to hear from you today, Dr. Diedrich. Thank you so much for being with us. Dr. Dan Diedrich is an anesthesiologist, critical care physician, and incidentally, the medical director for our respiratory therapists here at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks so much for being with us today, Dan. Thank you for inviting me. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.